Hi, I'm Jenny. I am the host of the Cloud Cafes on behalf of Stroud District Green Party. And um, I'm currently based in Spain, but um, definitely left our hearts in Stroud. So um, that's why we continue to work with Stroud Greens. But um, today we've got a in very interesting Cloud Cafe that is um, going to be touching on a whole host of subjects that are interested to our usual audience. So thanks everybody for joining as always and um, taking part in these Cloud Cafes. This month's talk is courtesy of Hawkwood College, which is, uh, if you were just on, uh, Yolanda has just explained that it was, uh, a, it's a charity that functions in Stroud. Uh, and our speaker this evening is somebody who's working on a project with Hawkwood College uh, called Sarah Kablatin, um, who has 15 years of experience in peace building, cultural heritage conservation, environmental education, and humanitarian assistance. She does this as a co-founder of Green Relief Initiative in the Philippines, a member of Permaculture for Refugees and Realliance. She designs enabling ecosystems of collaboration through innovation labs and learning journeys through resource regeneration labs and green relief. Um, and also is a part of the Global Eco Village Network for Oceania and Asia, uh, which is an organization that we're very aware of and is a very interesting organization. Um, but she's part of the Wisdom Circle there and um, is a member of the Permaculture for Refugees as well. The list goes on. There's so many interesting things here that I could tell you about her, but she's going to tell you herself, I'm sure, and a whole host more that I uh, definitely am not party to. So, Sarah, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And um, everybody will, I'm sure, have a whole host of questions at the end of this, which everybody who's on, you're free to use the chat function to um, pose questions and we can ask Sarah at the end of her presentation, but I think she's got some slides for us to go through first. So thanks, Sarah, and um, take us away. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, salamat, uh, which is thank you in Tagalog in the Philippine language. Thank you so much. Salamat for inviting me. And I was just sharing earlier for those who came in when before we started formally, I, I actually had um, the privilege of, of you know joining the first um, formation of the Philippine Green Party. So I'm kind of remembering those days. I haven't fully uh, joined it, but I know the cause and the purpose and the mission. So a little bit, at least from what I've, I've kind of um, followed in the past. So it's really meaningful to, to hear and meet some uh, members of the Green Party in this, um, in this part of the world. Thank you for having me. And I believe the invitation was for me to share what I shared last night at the RSA event and a little bit about um, this work with um, working with climate story, climate storytelling and transforming the narrative of the climate crisis. And at least in our experience, we're using the arts and culture as one of it, but um, we're integrating the arts and culture in a more together with other approaches with advocacy and uh, restoration um, restoration planning and um, and to be able to institutionalize it as well. And so I will share a combination of, of um, ways to I'm um, doing this work and um, I will probably start with this um, well the idea is to restore and restore narratives of place and belonging through climate memory and imagination and I work with both memory and imagination in both um, climate and conflict contexts and I will share some experiences both from my organization Green Relief and Living Story Landscapes project which is my passion project where it's more related to the arts and culture but working with restoration of landscapes. Um, and just a, as a, a way to, yeah, like the disclaimer here, I will share from my personal journey. I also shared projects that we're doing in response to climate, primarily climate adaptation over mitigation. 
And then applied leadership and creativity. So just really more coming from as a leader and also how we engage people in leadership together and then some creative lenses. And then at the end, I will share a little bit about the emerging project on documenting loss and damage to arts and culture. And how we're also in this project with Hawkwoods and Wonders on the Earth, how we're also kind of becoming a springboard for that. And so just probably not everyone's familiar or maybe familiar the Philippines is one of the most climate vulnerable nations in the world. We're actually top one in the climate, uh, like kind of the disaster risk index, which doesn't only cli cover climate change, but other, this, uh, other, other risks like terrorism or war or um, volcanoes. <laughs> and so we have a lot of those um, because we are in the typhoon belts in the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, so we we are we face a lot of vulnerabilities, and climate emergencies have been in our doorsteps. Not even in our doorsteps; it's been in our house houses, or or to say the houses that <laughs> used to stand in many communities. And we really experience the brunt of climate um, change, where you know we're beyond adaptation mainly because of you know. And when you say beyond adaptation, these are this is now where countries like mine are looking into loss and damage, climate loss and damage. And um, apart from the, the fast, you know, impact, impactful um, events like typhoons or floods, we also experience the slow onset um, uh, impacts of climate change, which is the rise of sea levels. Um, it's not as worse as the Pacific islands like Vanuatu and other areas that are sinking, but we are sinking. Some of our islands are in. Um, this is one island that shows that uh, experience. And um, I'll bring you to, I guess you're all familiar with this, so it's probably not something that will be interesting, but for me, it's very important for me because I've been to the climate cops and, and just to, you know, every year during the climate cops, actually every year we have typhoon, super typhoons. And so every time I follow the progress, and actually, you know, the Paris Agreement Gulf 1.5, that was the first COP I've been in, um, that, they, that threshold we're trying to aim for and where we are as of 2021 is we are in 1.2. And the optimistic scenario where all of the, you know, if we meet the zero waste targets, zero waste targets, zero targets, the NDCs, the National Determined Targets, uh, com uh, commitments, uh, contributions, sorry, um, we will still meet 1.8. And if, oh, if it only just pledges, if it, it will be 2.1, if only just the 2030 targets, 2.4 policies in action, 2.7. So where we are, we've already been experiencing the brunt and we are still in 1.2. So we can't imagine really how, or maybe we can imagine because we've, we can probably just multiply the intensity if that's, um, and it's not a good scenario for, for countries like mine. And, and you would say, you know, this, um, it's, it's really an, it's really an issue also of, of um, who contributes the most to uh, the, the, the cost no, of climate change and who gets affected the most as well. Um, I'm very, very careful of using the word, uh, the word poorest and then using economic terms to determine people's capacity or, or um, but just for this purposes of showing, you know, like based on economic wealth, the richest nations and uh, the 10% at least contributes almost, almost the same as the middle countries and the poorest nations who have less impact mostly um, have that, um, uh, are get, get more affected. And we're not just talking about my country, we're talking about a global um, you know, extinction event kind of level. Um, it's really, you know, when we go 1.5 degrees, it's maize, rice, and wheat, they, it suffers. And then two degrees, you know, so you, I won't name it anymore, you would see it in the charts. And this progression is, is you know, this is, um, yeah, it, it is levels that, that that maybe it's beyond our imagination well, but um, it is likely possible if nothing changes. And then water, when we think of water and sort shortages and droughts, um, and that's very, very critical, especially for 
uh, dry lands or areas that you know have forest fires and and already experiencing forest fires and other things. And then for flora and fauna, it's like it's critical for us because we have a lot of dependence on seafood and um, marine life. And so if in if two degrees is our temperature, that really means all our color waves will disappear. And in ahead of that, we're already seeing massive um, impacts on our um, marine ecosystem. So, so the way we're designing this is really looking at the crisis from, you know, how we see the crisis in the first place. So it's not really, um, which could be the key, you know, using a holistic approach rather than just um, a fragmented approach. And my experience really started in disaster zones after typhoons. And I saw how much intervention have been fragmented. And, and it, I wondered like, could you res respond to a broken system with a broken solution? Um, it doesn't work well. It has to be a holistic solution because the situation is a broken situation. So, and so this, in, this invitation is looking at um, our, our awareness to, to engage all the parts of the whole. I won't go into detail with this because maybe it's not so um, of interest for the read party, but my background is really in the arts and culture. I've trained in expressive arts therapy and I've worked with a peace process in the Philippines with the government and the more Islamic liberation fronts, work with indigenous elders for peace building and interfaith dialogue. And I've worked with, um, climate survivors um, working with uh, ceremony and ritual and art therapy and also been part of the climate justice movement and working with um, spiritual groups to, to give voices to moral uh, moral leadership and climate change. And then, um, yeah, this is from COP21 uh, in Paris and, and just this story of like the repeated narrative of, you know, having to put our their babies in the basin every time a flood happens or typhoons happen or that this scene is so familiar every time. I don't even know what typhoon this is because it just can be anything and it can be repeated as well. And so I started in my nonprofit Green Relief using permaculture and eco-village design in, in responding to emergencies and working with food sovereignty, regenerative livelihood and ecosystem adaptation and working with um, survivors like grassroots leaders. And in the last 12 years, since I started Green Relief as a volunteer organization and then a nonprofit in 2017, we noted these patterns of what is a way to design, to shift the narrative of disaster risk reduction to that of designing for resilience and regeneration. So these elements of circularity, innovation, long-term major based or trauma-informed, local and survivor-led, have been kind of key to our work. And so in our work is really, we're trying to redefine how we respond and re by reimagining um, in a more holistic way. So after prototyping for three years, we prototyped in a post-disaster area. We also prototype in a, like a long after, like one or two years after disaster. And we realized we can't be in every disaster zone. Um, we are, you know, we can only like contribute so much. And if we have to build a project on site, it's a lot of resources, but we end up only assisting one community. And the magnanimity of what we're facing, we need to scale faster, uh, but deeper as well, just to hold meaning and trust in the process with the people that we work with. And so our lens is now is to look into preparedness and response, which we're launching a mutual aid mapping platform and then relief and recovery is when we work in evacuation camps and resettlements, but now we're also developing some toolkits. And lastly, is uh, um, preparing more grassroots leaders to be trained permaculture in this, uh, the um, permaculture and in disasters and displacement, and then looking at landscape labs where we bring in stakeholders together to to design solutions for restoring their landscapes. Nice. And um, um, Sorry, oh, I can't seem to move the slides. Sorry, one second. Uh, okay, 
So um, I won't go, I skip some things, but um, just an overview about what we're doing. This is the relief community platform where in an emergency, we realize there are the people who feel the cracks. These are the women who donate breast milk or mental health practitioners who volunteer or people who provide solar panels or community kitchen. So we're, we're developing this platform as a way to for people to know who's doing what in an emergency and that they can assist. At the same time, um, we're also wanting to, you know, be able to channel resources from others um, who want to help. And then also like a repository for best practices um, in peacetime when there's no emergency. And then these are shared with you some trainings on uh, working with grassroots leaders, um, we trained and, and then that they learned the tools for growing food, managing water resources, and adapting to their landscape. And we've developed a prototype where you use permaculture in, in the camp or settlements, and that, you know, and even in a small way, it showed us that it's doable. Uh, we were just impacted by the pandemic, so we couldn't complete and close the project. And we designed the process with the survivor's experience because we believe those who have survived are the best teachers of this design. And then also we work with indigenous peoples and their food systems and that so we bring their knowledge in the work. Um, I don't know if there are permaculture practitioners in the room. I just want to see a show of hands and thumbs up as well. I'm going to stop share screen there for a bit before I go further. The question was if there are any permaculturists. Permaculture practitioners, yeah. Practitioners in the room. Yeah. It, I think people should be able to put a hand up or a thumb up. Yeah. I think, I'm not sure if we would have anybody in the room. Um, yeah, no worries. So, uh, yeah, just ask because um, uh, I've, um, one of the things... Um, I've studied it, but um, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it, but I've studied it. Mm. So just to give a context, so it's working with nature and designing with nature. And so I've, um, I'm going to go back to the slide where uh, mostly because permaculture is often um, conducted by white teachers and it was bound to be two white men. So we wanted to acknowledge that there's already existing traditional ecological knowledge in the landscape. And I proposed a principle that permaculturists use around the world. 20 million people use permaculture. Um, and this explicit acknowledgement of traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous wisdom must be part of the design. So we're trying to model that in this work. And we're developing a toolkit for emergency gardens as well, using some checklists that people can do use. And also like some of these um, uh, tools for um, show, showing and telling and guiding people. Um, and then lastly is rehabilitation and prevention. So we're, uh, we just launched a lab that would look into scaling regenerative agriculture, livelihoods, working with fisher folk and farmers to scale marine permaculture, to look into um, addressing the flood zones with native trees. And so we're really aiming to scale up by institutionalizing the best practice, but also scale wide replicating. But the most important part of this lab is to have deep, deep relationships to scale deep and have a sense of leadership and purpose across stakeholders. And it's a learning journey. It has leadership mentoring, well-being support, weaving ecosystems and impact occupations. Um, and we're journeying for um, address, we're piloting in my island where I live, where there are many opportunities for forest restoration, ecosystem-based risk reduction, marine permaculture, um, um, to ecotourism and river and coastal restoration and regenerative food systems. And together with Living Storage Landscapes, which is my, my passion project as well, working with the arts and culture, is I'm collaborating with Hawkwoods for this one and One Resilient Earth, where um, we've uh, worked on a journey, a learning journey that includes the arts and culture to document um, the narratives of a landscape and how people perceive the challenges and what are the wisdom that they still carry. And together with local artists who are here in Shroud, if you're coming tomorrow, they're also in, featured as in the Archers Showcase. We're journeying 
um, for a year. And then using Inspired by Theory U and Filipino Systems Thinking, we're trying to bring landscape actors together, which we already did. And then we're, we've entered the co-sensing phase where we're using the arts and culture to, to equip people in the landscape or those who help them to document um, and analyze what are challenges in the landscape. And, and then in the middle or in the middle of the year, we're aiming for an exhibition of these artworks and documentation, films, photography, art paintings um, that emerge from this co-sensing phase. And looking at the community museum design where we would show um, you know, the what people documented, the interviews, the recordings and videos. And that way it becomes an inspiration for policymakers or planners to incubate scalable projects towards the end of the of this journey. And this is also the time where we look at our own leadership because oftentimes we're often looking into the external stuff, how much we've done, what are we gonna do tomorrow, but really looking at our roles as leaders. And this is also where after seeing the documentation of the opportunities and challenges of the landscape, we would hope that this is, could be a restoration strategy planning as well. Um, and then we're using the arts as a way to um, also be applicable uh, to stories and portraits and, and restoration planning and maps. And this way it can also functional. It's not just art for art's sake, but rather really be relevant. And so now we go to loss and damage. And I just want to check and pause again because it's been like me talking a lot. And I just want to check if there are questions and then go to the next part. Um, if anybody has any questions, then feel free to unmute yourself. But I mean, if... Um... I mean, if I say so myself, this is really fascinating. And I think don't feel like you have to skip over any of the arts and culture part because this group of people will be very interested in that as well. And, um, you know, art as a way of talking about and communicating about these really complex issues is like something that the Green Party um, is really keen to promote and really wants to uh, advocate for. So. Wow. Thank you for sharing uh, so far. If nobody has any questions, then um, maybe we can keep going. But um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be lots at the end. Thank you. Great. Thanks. So yeah, so let's go to um, loss and damage. Um, so loss and damage is um, uh, primarily like a, it's a term. Um, there's no actual like. Um, like kind of very solid definition of it, but from what it is, it talks about what people lost and whether the damages. And it's currently as defined, they're um, defined according to two, economic and non-economic losses. And I learned more about this when I was invited as one of the regional, um, there was a regional consultation on loss and damage in Southeast Asia. And it was so eye-opening because we realized now we're beyond adaptation and we must call for uh, the recognition of loss and damage, which if you've been following the climate COPs, the Conference of Parties, the recent COP27 has highlighted that, um, that they've now countries who commit into looking into financing loss and damage for countries who are unable to, to have the capacity to to prevent further risks and are in the position of, you know, having to count their losses and damages. And, and our interest is primarily to look into the documentation of non-economic losses, um, because most of the ways to measure, you know, economic losses, they're existing as well. Um, but here it's really hard to quantify life or health or human mobility or indigenous wisdom or cultural heritage or biodiversity. And this is where we're trying to see what if the arts and culture can help work with climate scientists, work with researchers to make, give more meaning to these losses and even go beyond the, the economic lens, you know, because we're, and maybe it could be the problem in the first place too, but um, so yeah, I, I've, I've worked in communities, like this is an, a workshop I developed with an indigenous woman. I was one of the artists and residents here too. Her name is Domin McCagney. And in Sagada, we, um, she invited me to develop a workshop with their Kankanai elders on a disaster risk reduction planning. And we envisioned you know, how people wanted to, um, to become. And then 
ended up developing a tool on how you use the tree as a as to build the components of a log frame, which were drawn out of the visions that they wanted for their community. So I'm sharing this because it really has helped, you know, having all these creative tools to engage community in storytelling rather than cognitive planning. And in my journey working with uh, the arts, I work with a uh, trauma-informed lens because I primarily le I learned more about art therapy and um, mental health and psychosocial support. So this journey from survivor to thriver, you know, it's how we model our response. And as an artist, I work, try to also work with the creative handles where um, as the systems collapse, you know, we're looking at the illusion is revealed, you know, that we thought the system, this kind of worldview is supposed to keep us alive or this kind of consumption pattern is, you know, okay. And so this illusion invites us to look into our intuition, looking at what we already know, our inner knowing, our traditional knowledge, our confidence and uh, existing resources in the landscape. And that goes into restoring you know, the past, what we have lost, this worldviews, these narratives, the seeds we've lost, the lands and the ancestral knowledge and bringing that into, you know, into heart. And as we create a new system, it's now midwifing with imagination, you know, that we can now start to create the future that we want. And this is where thrivers are now more, you know, they're, this is where you now you've moved from survivor to thriver. You're more capable of responding to shocks better and, and being able to thrive and manage that. It's not saying you'll never experience it, but rather that you have a system. You have the food system. When a pandemic happens again and lockdowns happen, you still have food. Or So that's basically a thriver um, uh, experience. And so this emerging project on action or it, this is still emerging, so we're sharing it to, to give more attention to it. There, we're currently developing a, an action research with the University of the Philippines in Cebu and someone from Manila Observatory in, in Manila and looking at documenting loss and damage that's locally inclusive, we builds evidence that conserves local biodiversity, cultural and natural heritage, that weaves art and climate science, to influence local restoration plans and policies to channel loss and damage financing and transform the narrative of economic measurements. Loss and damage, and I forgot this should be earlier in the term, but just so that it has defined is, you know, when you, the, the consequences of climate change go beyond what people can adapt to or where options exist, but the community doesn't have the resources to access or utilize them. So this is the aftermath of super typhoon Rai um, in two years, two years ago, and uh, which became category one into category five in 24 hours. And so those things are not everyone's ready for that. The reason why we're looking into a research approach is because currently um, this, uh, there's a knowledge gap on non-economic loss and damage because you know, little voices, small um, coordination with the global south also. And that's, um, and this is important because to quantify or to, to give value, if not even quantify, but just to give value to hidden costs of climate change, like the loss of cultural heritage and other things, we want to be able to use this action research to, to meet these intentions. Um, and so here are some examples how the arts and culture can help in documenting loss and damage. We've seen how the arts can make visible what is invisible, what people feel, what people's dreams are, what they feel are important. Um, and then, you know, the arts have been proven to offer healing through its therapeutic impacts um, that, you know, whether you work with art therapy or body and somatic movements, it is very much healing, especially for communities in transition after loss. And it's also a place for expressing grief and challenges and the impacts of the loss because Art, the arts create that sacred space, the third space where people can, can be heard and seen and be able to um, get that part of the grief um, 
going. And we want not just to be like, oh, an exhibition, but we actually want work working with climate scientists and integrate data with it, with story. So that it's not just the rise, the number of um, inches it grew, uh, the, the, the water rise, but rather, you know, what does it mean for a farmer or fisher folk who's, you know, um, so we want to validate data with story. And to build collective inspiration, so it's when people know who's doing what and being able to be inspired and learn from them, we sustain the efforts and, and get to um, meet more of the goals together rather than separate. And then to institutionalize solutions with empathic and realistic inputs to a plan or design. So basically, we want, um, at some point, want uh, things that are because the arts help reveal the value and importance of something, hopefully it may build empathy and inspiration to those who can institutionalize um, the solutions being offered. And then exclusively, inclusively express narratives because most people in the communities, not all of them are literate, but rather, you know, they tell stories a lot. So we use the story as a way to um, describe an intention. Um, and and to be able to share, you know, um, how people feel about the challenge um, and without words, uh, because maybe some can try it or some can express. And then we want to document narratives of change of landscapes over time. So, um, yeah, like how what people have observed during, you know, a certain period of the decade or in the late next dec previous decade, and then to see, you know. Why do we have landslides or why do we have forests um, flooding and, and flooding and, and less trees? So being able to use the arts to help document that. And then of course, you know, whatever is proof of concept or evidence that comes out of this is that we are able to help support and finance um, channel at least as finance for this intention. And then to preserve local knowledge and wisdom is to, um, honor that and because when the arts and culture is one way to to tell to kind of freeze it in time but and also kind of give more attention to it and then lastly it's a great third space for dialogue and emergence of something that you're born and I ask that I say that because I know the arts can create this space to help people decenter and get out of their minds but also just looking into what is more generative to go beyond what we already know, and and this is important for policy working with policymakers or, or businesses and civil society and the biases we have, and the arts can help create that space of trust. And whether people, you know, draw together or dance together, they start thinking of getting out of their heads, but really truly listen to each other, um, and then in an in the process, being able to invite people to to you know, with enough trust to, to design something else in the future. I think the slide ends here. So our next step is to formalize research partnerships with the universities we're working with. We're looking for UK institutions we could work with as well. And then um, because we're applying for um, a U British Council collaboration as well for this to continue, we're hoping to develop the action research design and then to integrate this with creative storytelling, which we've been doing. We just did that. This is actually the first workshop we did uh, last week. And develop a community museum where the artworks, the profiles and narratives of a landscape are featured. And then of course, to raise resources to implement the next phases. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry if like it sounds more monotonous. It's so weird when it's on Zoom now <laughs> attempted I presented it on in person, but if you need to reach out, these are my links. And then I'll be happy to respond further. Salamat po. And I'm going to stop share here. Salamat po. Thank you so much. That was, um, you know, a lot of information in um, to take in, but so fascinating. And I really appreciate you, you know, sharing this cultural side and artistic side of what you do as, you know, as a, as a mode of, um, working with these really complex systems and also working with the survivors of these, you know, horrific um, environmental events that are taking place on, not like you say, it's not like a once in a lifetime event anymore. These are like consistently happening to people um, 
and those who are like living on the front line of climate. I think um, there's so many points that I've noted down that you were talking about. I think one of the really pertinent things that you said was around um, responding to a broken system with a broken solution. I think, I don't know, you know how much you know about British politics, but that is all our government seems to do. Um, that is the consistent approach that we take and, and, and redesigning for resilience and regeneration, like you said, like reimagining these solutions and trying to find something that works to create a better world is fascinating. So thank you for sharing all that. I know we've already got one question from Elizabeth. As we're quite a small group today, people feel free to turn your cameras on and, um, oh, we're not allowed to turn our cameras on. Oh. Oh. Okay, Elizabeth, you've turned your camera on. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> feel free to ask your question and unmute. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a fascinating um, discussion and um, so interested in the work that you do. Um, really interested in the sort of tools that you use as well. There were some tantalizing pictures of um, some of the work that people were doing. So firstly, I just wondered whether you had any specific tools you used. I can see that you're using mapping for example of communities um and also i just wondered whether you are oh, and how you are documenting all this and where you're presenting it as well it's obviously really important information that needs to go go forward and go on to others thanks elizabeth oh you're muted sarah sorry sorry yeah the tools would vary thank you so much elizabeth um they would vary depending on the the context of the um, how we engage with them. Um, of course, um, a lot of them are participatory mostly, and also ways to document and read the landscape, um, but in levels that are more grassroots, you know, understandable. Um, uh, yeah, like I shared with you, like sometimes we use images and stories. Um, one of the images you probably saw was people on the circle and they like have these drawings in the middle. It's a resilience map about, you know, a livelihood project they want to come up with. But before we look into what do they need from outside is drawing in what they already have as tools and skills and values in the landscape first. Um, we use uh, um, participatory planning and um, uh, some tools on listening, like Theory U as well, and Filipino system thinking, and how we engage people to deeply listen and, and to be able to engage deeper from that place of um, listening and awareness. Um, I guess it would vary, so it's a bit broad question, so I hope this helped a little bit. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. So, um, as okay. yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, we, we usually just invite people to ask the questions themselves if they would like to. Lynn, would you like to unmute? Thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you, Sarah, very much. This is very interesting. Um, the question I have is um, whether you're working with children and do you work with them separately from adults or are they integrated into the work that you're doing? And yeah. are there particular approaches that you have to work with children and young people? And the a reason I'm really interested in that is in when I lived in Central America, we had um, we developed a small arts project for children. We lived in a very destitute poor area of the country, and um, one of the things we discovered is that children had no access to art and creativity. Um, mm -hmm. And providing that opportunity for them was really important to, to build their self-esteem and their sense of self-awareness um, and leadership skills um, in the community. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my question is, how are you working with young people and children? Yeah, good question. They're not our main targets at the moment. Um, we work primarily with leaders and innovators um, because uh, we believe that nurturing them could help catalyze things faster. Um, so um, we did work with children before. Um, um, it, it's some child-friendly um, activities and art therapy, but at the moment they're not our main um, 
yeah, I guess partners, um, but that we support them indirectly by supporting the leaders who, of course, have to deal with some of their well-being stuff as well. Um, uh, yeah, and also that we've engaged students, university students now, and starting to realize we do need that research partnership, and um, that's when where they're going to come in as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful answers. We also Thanks. work in in the Department of Education schools, the public schools, to build permaculture gardens, and that's meant for the children there to be able to experience it and learn from it. Um, yeah, I think that that's also part of the. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so our next question is from Lucas. Yeah, my question is, have you worked with people in the developed world also who are experiencing climate anxiety? Definitely got it sort of around the 20 year olds or even a lot of young guy. Uh, mm -hmm. People experience climate anxiety. Yeah. Uh, this work would seem to me, gives me a fabulous wellness experience. And one of it, I, I believe or I'm convinced that this work would really do them an enormous amount of good and be able to place their, their role maybe better or their place in, in the whole developing story. Yeah. Yeah, so, so interesting. When I first read about climate anxiety and climate grief, I, I wanted to like, wow, we've been experiencing this for a long time. And, um, you know, and, 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 somehow a little bit painful to actually recognize that oh well, it has to take a westerner a western world or um global north to experience it to actually coin it and say it's important um because my background is in psychosocial support and working with um psychologists and and people on the ground after a disaster and you know, it's really hard to to really say in the fact that we didn't have a word for it and we've been going through it for years um, also tells about, you know, how we recognize it's real. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it cuts across. There is many young people, definitely the younger generation who feels that. Um, and for me as well as like, yeah, I think um, being able to engage people for looking at long term is one of the ways that people also feel that they can recover it. But um, I myself experienced it. Uh, last year I was really burned out because I realized, wow, I forgot that uh, the typhoon Rai actually hit my home and I was away out of the country. So it just sank into me. That's the reason why I was not thinking straight or feeling well because it was just this idea like should I want to live here again or or that um you know do I have a family in the first place or and then live here so that's part of that experience as well and I think the level of anxiety is kind of different because the resilience is you know we've been experiencing it a lot so people would be more resilient though it's we don't want to romanticize that because it takes out the responsibility and accountability of those who, who are contributing to the problem so um but yeah i don't know if that's helpful we yeah and and we thought um the the way we're working with our journeys that we would have uh check-ins and um uh um at retreats for leaders and that way they could really look into some of their things they're afraid of and challenge with and have the tools to address them. Thank you. Thanks. You're a very full answer. Love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Work with that. Thanks, Lucas. And um, thanks, Sarah, again. Um, we haven't had another question yet, but I would like to ask a question. Yeah. Um about the the oh sorry, Mike, Mick, sorry, Mick, you go first. Attendees priority. Uh, you're on mute still, Nick. Sorry. Classic. Um, no, I came to this late, I'm afraid, but I, I'd forgotten it was on. Um, but I, I, my interest in, in the whole subject of of climate grief or climate anxiety or eco anxiety, it's got several names, I think, yeah. is that I was um, recently in prison with a cell, my cellmate who who mentioned the word, and I hadn't really. Um, 
I hadn't really acknowledged it um, as a as a condition. And then I did a bit more research um, once I was out of prison and found that it's recognised um, uh, a mental condition, really, a condition that needs to be addressed. Uh, and I, I, he was a young, um, uh, you know, in mid-20s or something, and I, I wondered if... Um, if it's acknowledged that it it there is no age barrier uh, to this, and that it, and it affects, I mean, I obviously, you know, I'm, I'm past retirement age now, so I've realised I've basically been suffering from it and looking for an outlet. And as you can probably guess, the reason I was in prison is because I took action to relieve the feeling of complete helplessness, and I I, I just wondered. Um, if the medical profession is is beginning to catch up with this, or is it going to be just small groups? Um, I came across a couple of researchers in Bath University who were who were doing um, uh, did a study on it, and so I think it's being looked at. But I just wondered what, in general, people can um, expect to get in the way in the way of help if they turn to their their GP and the normal channels. Would they be acknowledged? Um, and would they even think of going? That's just a, that's just a starter, really. Mm, thanks, mate. Um, it's hard for me to tell in terms of your worlds um, how you know mainstream it is. Um, so I'd be careful to respond to that. Um, but in our place, I don't think it's widely understood because people just have to cope, you know, and, and most often psychological interventions actually just arrive after a disaster. So it's not really like, you know, um, uh, it's not widely available. Um, and, but it, it does show up in some of the challenges of families and communities. Um, the thing about this is that, uh, it is one of the things that people worry about because there are a lot of other things like poverty or mm. um, political, you know, challenges. Or uh, so it's it's one of the things that it's not the only thing, uh, and it's systemic. And so it's important to note that. But I believe it's starting to get more attention and support. Um, uh, and when you say across the ages, I would think so, because I, I've met so many amazing elders of, you know, who believe, you know, go, go through it. They're more, they're more priorities actually making sure that their legacy or the younger generation, they protect them. And that actually worries them a lot. At least that's what I hear as well from the older generations. Mm. Um, yeah, but it's not so... You know, it's not often so understood, indeed, uh, because it's so intangible. You know, and 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 there must be other issues that probably people feel are more important, like depression or poverty, and something like this may not necessarily be an immediate threat, but actually mm. could be. Yeah, and I'd yeah. love to hear from others in the room. Maybe you know better from your part. Of <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. I guess, um, I mean, I worked in the NHS for eight years, and I think that um, mental health as a whole has only just started to be recognised and talked about in a very serious way over the last, let's say, 10 years or five years more so. And I think that climate anxiety, um, like you say, is something that has not been recognised. Um, and it's something that, like you also say, probably many people have experienced for a very long time without coining that word of climate anxiety or climate um you know depression or whatever it might be so I think that this will be in the coming months something that more people are affected by and therefore our NHS or our National Health Service will respond uh, to that but at the minute with the current resources and state of affairs um, mm -hmm. that our NHS is dealing with I think it won't be prioritized which is a shame because so many people are dealing with this and have been for a long time. Thank you for your question, Mick, uh, and for joining us today. Um, okay, yes? Just Can I just follow up on that quickly by, by saying that in my view, if someone hasn't got climate anxiety, 
they've not been fully informed. And uh, in the actual fact, I think not to have climate anxiety is almost a condition of its own. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's my that's my personal opinion. But uh, I think, yeah, it's like uh, it, it's just, it shouldn't be a problem we have because it should be being um, dealt with in a systematic and orderly manner. And we should be reassured that um, it's getting sorted. But unfortunately, I, I can't see that happening. So we're stuck with that anxiety at the moment. Anyway, absolutely. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Don't worry. But yes, you're absolutely right. I think when people, when the government or the people or the society starts to properly address the issues that we're facing with regards to climate and loss and damage and things, then maybe the anxiety will ease slightly. But until that point, mm. it's going to be very difficult. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any more questions? From can, I, can I ask a question, please? Yes, sure. Thanks. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, I, I'm very, I, I found your talk very impressive, actually. Um, the range of um, opportunities to get involved is extraordinary. Um, the, the, the thing that strikes me is that it seems your society in the Philippines is somehow more cooperatively functioning and um, less atomized. Um, so, you know, making um, the, these kind of, uh, well, these endeavours to create more community resilience, uh, it, it seems to be a more easy thing to do in, in, in the Philippines than perhaps in, in the UK. And, and you know, as I listened, I just feel very, um, you know, almost guilty that, um, you know, that not doing more, you know, that, so that's, that's one question. Um, the other question I had was, do, do you feel that the, uh, these typhoons that you've experienced, uh, do you think it's solely to do with um, the, the temperature issue uh, of um, GHGs, greenhouse gas emissions, or do you think there's factors involved in that? Um, because when I've been reading um, a book, Peter Taylor, uh, Chill, and um, you know, one of the main things in that book is that is the natural cycles are not really um, included in the conversation. And it is not just about carbon dioxide. So I'd like to hear what you think about um, those, two, those two things, please. Uh, thanks. I can uh, just summarize because it was dropping in and out a little bit there. Um, so the first question was around community and building resilience. And the, there seems to be, I don't like a, um, there seems to be a, sen a bigger sense of community in the Philippines from what you were showing us with the slides um, than maybe there is currently in the UK, but we're in a very divisive point in the British history at the moment, as I'm sure the world knows. Um, so a bit, a bit about, you know, building community resilience. And then the second question, well, let's do the first question first and then we'll um, pose the second question. Um, but yeah, and then we appreciate um, you're a little bit jet lagged, Sarah. We will um, summarize and come to an end. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, well, it is an advantage, you know, a lot of us are um, culturally more oriented to working together and being with the community. So that could be one way to say we can be more resilient that way, but it's a bit dangerous to say as well that um, there's more advantage in terms of that because we don't want to romanticize resilience as if um, you know we can constantly um, use it as a as a way to um, continue to be that, and that uh, those who are accountable can't be held accountable for it. But basically, um, I just wanted to to say that. Um, uh, but also, definitely, it makes sense too because um, perhaps our sense of uh, support system, you know, still comes out from our indigenous values of cooperation. We have a term called Bayanihan, which is nation building. And this is where we use that term to build, to connect together and work on something together and volunteer spirit. 
Um, we are also driven by the concept of kapwa, which is the shared self. It is our Ubuntu. It's how we perceive things that are not separate from us. So it, it is one of the resources probably, and a lot of it is also on spirituality. A lot of Filipinos are very spiritual. And the core um, core ways that people Filipinos cope are through spirituality. And so in nations probably that have limited capacity for that, um, may be challenged, but um, we've seen the power of, of goodness when crisis happens. So maybe, in, you know, I don't know if it's cultural sometimes, but like if you've seen the forest fires in, in the US or Australia, you see people cooperating and collaborating. So I guess it would probably vary, like um, you would see the true colors of people when an emergency happens. and. I think most often than not, you would see the doers, the good doers um, there. And you've, you know, I'm sure one or two people have done any form of assistance. Um, and, and just a matter, I guess, of building the trust across time, even before or after and peacetime, so that when disaster happens, you were able to already have that level of trust across stakeholders. And it is easier to, to engage and um, work together to recover. Yeah. And Thanks, Sarah. Question, no? yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a great question as well. Um, so the second question was around uh, typhoons and uh, the causes of those and whether you think um, the severity of them is particularly involved with greenhouse gases. Sorry, I am absolutely not. Um, a scientist so <laughs> if that makes sense to you yeah. hopefully yeah. um but yeah any any comments that you have on that thank you yeah i mean we've had always had um typhoons over time so it's not it's like a but it's this hazard because as the the planet heats up you know with more ghgs it traps the heat and from that heat you know the oceans um creates more of that pressure and and that means it builds up more intense typhoons so that's kind of like the cause of it technically of course the cause is really the GHGs but then again you think about are they the really cause or our worldview of disconnection and increased consumption capitalism so that was probably the core core cause too and um it didn't really capture the intention of the question but um could you, could you, did I answer it? <laughs> Am I missing? Yeah, it? no, I think that was it. Uh, yeah, did you have I, it? I, I think what I was sort of saying was that, um, do, you, it, do you think the severity is actually increasing um, in the last 20 years? According to uh, the natural cycles sort of process, it may be that um, things could actually um, tail off, improve. Um, mm not and not keep going the down the the downward spiral as it were oh okay so whether it's been getting more severe over the last 20 years and whether it's possible that that could improve ah. yeah it's a bit so hard to say that um <laughs> i don't know not we don't really sound optimistic because as every year it gets more and more intense and unpredictable so that's kind of the trend already so um you know, if, if many countries, have, we all like are looking at 2030 as kind of, I think our part of the world should be looking at less than that and, um, you know, irreversible impacts of climate change. And it's when you say we have this until 2030s, like um, beyond that is, it's no really, not no longer reversible. We can't go back to the way it was, it will, uh, you know, technically it's not really reversible, but um, like we're just trying to meet as much as we can to reverse. But if we go beyond the threshold, um, yeah, it's, it's downhill from there, I guess. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you for answering all of our questions and um, joining us for this evening. We really appreciate it. It was obviously a discussion and topic that um, is very close to all of our hearts and is something that we're all interested in learning more about. Um, I wanted to briefly invite Yolande, do you have anything that you would like to add at the end and just tell us um, 
what's going on in Hawkwood or how we can get more involved, that would be great. Sure. So um, this week um, we're working on our restoring our living landscapes project. Um, so Hawkwood have been working in collaboration with Sarah um, and our other project partner, Laureline Simon, um, who's the founder of One Resilient Earth. And um, for those interested, Laureline works a lot with eco anxiety as well um, and futures literacy to help us become more climate resilient. Um, and the purpose of the, the project has been working with um, amplifying the role of creative in these in these climate discussions. So tomorrow evening at Hawkwood, we're having a event to um, celebrate some of the work who the, that the artists that have been going on this journey um, with us and and their responses to some of the, the themes um, around climate change have been themes and experiences. So it'd be you know, we'd love to welcome you to that as well. And you can find out more about that on our website. Fantastic. Okay, we will have a look at that. And um, I'm sure there's some people in here who can share on our social medias and things, because I'm sure some of our other members would be really interested in coming up to Hawkwood and having a look at that. Um, so thank you very much to Sarah, to Yolan. Thank you very much for Again, everybody joining us as you always do. And um, thank you to anyone who's watching this back as well. Um, our next session is in March and we are being uh, taken over by the by the Stroud Young Greens. I am led to believe, I think Rosie's here. Um, I saw her name somewhere, but um, they'll be joining us next time. So make sure to pop it in your diary and to join us for that. Um, today we've had a session with Sarah and looking at the impacts uh, on those at the front line of the climate crisis and how um, they're using art and discussion and healing to uh, work with survivors of um, the climate crisis and also trying to respond to this broken system with solutions that are innovative and reimagined to help us build a better world and something that is adaptable um, to meet the needs of the people in the most affected areas. Uh, I'm sure that Sarah, when she's had some sleep, will uh, share some links and things with us that we can uh, look at to get involved and learn more as well. And thanks again, Sarah, for Thank joining you. us. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. If you'd like to just turn your cameras on and give us a quick wave to um say thank you so much to sarah but thanks everybody and we will see you in march